Hello and welcome to the Tour de France podcast with humansinvent.com. My name is Richard Moore uh, and I'm in Montpellier tonight joined by Lionel Burney and Daniel Freib. Lionel, would you be able to tell us exactly where we are? Well, we're sitting on the steps outside the Stade Yves du Manoir, which is the home of Montpellier Rugby Club, who uh, I think finished in about the top six in the French Rugby Union Championship last season. It's a jolly nice little stadium. It's not the biggest stadium in Montpellier. That's a that's the cross town where Montpellier Football Club play. But this is the becoming a bit of a traditional stop on the Tour de France for us, isn't it? And uh, we've, we've been in this press room a couple of times um, inside the stadium, and today the finish of the stage was just uh, a couple of streets away over over the compound here with all the TV trucks. So once again, we're watching the Tour de France pack up around us, and uh, once we once we finish this, we'll be off to find something better for dinner. So yes, here we are in Montpellier, the scene of uh, many memories over the years. Uh, Daniel, you'll recall that a few years ago we had our folding bikes here. I think it was the day of the Team Time Trial in 2009. That was the famous folding bike Tour de France, where you, me and Ellis Bacon did a did our own Tour de France every night, where we, we did a stage on the folding bikes, didn't we? We did. And I seem to remember we set off from the start, which was about three or four kilometres away, mm. as the crow flies. And we found ourselves, after about 10 kilometres, a fairly mazy journey, after about 10 kilometres we found ourselves alongside the Team Time Trial route, alongside L- Lotto, Silence Lotto, Silence Lotto overtaking who, were, them, I think. who were falling apart at the time. It was yeah. actually, it was even on the hill that we were overtaking. We were going faster. Than we were going well. We this, had good legs that day. This was in warm-up, I'm assuming, not no, in the, the race No, the actual itself. race. No, this they, was they in the race itself. People. They were <laughs> people were crashing. Uh, yeah. Charlie we- Wigalius, I seem to remember, who was at the tour, was riding that day. He didn't look too good. We were, you know, we were drilling it though, weren't we? Rich? We were going really well. We did then get lost and almost missed the, yeah. missed the stage entirely. <laughs> <laughs> and Sounds eventually familiar. Away back. So we saw a whole other side of Montpellier that day. I can <laughs> tell you. Other than that, it's a beautiful city. Um, we uh, just to. Finish. I'm sure people are curious about our, our Tour de France on uh, folding bikes. We held the prologue time for it in an underground car park. Do you remember that? Well, I think you and I rode, but Ellis wouldn't ride because he was... He was he worried was, about insurance. He, no, he was worried about upsetting the the Guardian or something, wasn't he? Yeah, they weren't. He wasn't very happy. It wasn't... He it wouldn't, it wouldn't have passed health and safety in Britain. But, Daniel, we're very pleased to have you back with us tonight because you had a very close scrape yesterday with uh, while driving to Marseille. Yeah. I'm still, as you can hear, I'm still pretty shell shocked, but yeah. I am here. Are you able to talk about it? Um, I think you probably. I heard that you told the Eddie Merckx Marseille story very well yesterday. I'm sure mm. you also covered my incident on the auto route in, you know, scary. painstaking detail and did a very good job. No. Yeah, it was scary though. It was very scary. One yeah, of the, yeah. One of the, I was shaken up for a few hours and um, missed the stage. <laughs> it's one of those ignominious days where you. That, I think I can only think of one. That's the, I think the first one in my Tour de France career when I've completely missed the stage. We've, I think we've cut it pretty fine and almost got um, to the, almost yeah. missed the finish once or twice. No, we have missed another finish, and I was. I was oh, hoping, was I was that the shoes? No, we Rich. Actually, we, I think we got into the press room with about a kilometre to go. I don't think we did. Oh, I think Tamman and I did, and we dropped you off somewhere. Probably, probably. <laughs> I don't know in the the grottiest part of. Bordeaux, Bordeaux. which is what you deserved after just, that. Just to Absolute. fill in here, this was the incident where, which was Brendan Gallagher wrote about in the mm. cycling anthology yeah, Tour de France. He name. But he didn't name you, Richard, but you left uh, a, a pair of shoes, uh, an yeah. expensive pair of shoes Old that were, were a gift in, in the hotel and had travelled a couple of hundred kilometres down the road before you realised. Let's not get carried away here. It wasn't a couple of hundred kilometres. Let's not exaggerate. <laughs> you had to turn oh, back. Don't. Three Apply days that sort worth. of poetic license to some of your published work, Lionel. I, I think you know. Anyway, let's, just, I think just, we've, we've just, covered that enough. Well, just to we? just to say welcome back to Daniel, and obviously, for those who didn't listen in yesterday, I, I can't imagine why why people wouldn't have listened in yesterday. But Daniel ha- had an incident on the auto route where a lorry shed its load and a box smashed uh, the wing mirror and the windscreen. And I think it's a sort of reminder to all of us really that covering the Tour de France, although it's a perilous um, business. It, it, you know, you're, you're, we're driving around France. We're kind of, you know, we're covering hundreds of kilometres a day. 
um, you know, we're packing everything up every every morning, and and you know, it, the tour hasn't really started until you've almost lost your wallet or been told off by the gendarme or or Line you left the car keys I'm in a hotel. <laughs> Generally speaking, the day any day of the year hasn't really started unless I've lost my wallet. <laughs> okay, let's talk about today's stage. Finally. Um, I, I guess we're waffling a bit because there isn't, there wasn't a lot, a lot to talk about really. Well, it was an exciting finale to the stage. And what was interesting for right from the off was that the break didn't go, and that's a, a real rarity. I, I was trying to think of the last time when that didn't happen, and it wasn't uh, the break didn't go. There wasn't a break. Well, exactly. There was no break, which is almost unheard of mm. on a. Everyone was anticipating the wind, weren't they? Um, yeah. We we touched on it a bit yesterday and uh, in the preview, hoping that the the Mistral would have its revenge on the tour and, and cause a bit of chaos in the form of um, in the form of echelons which are splits in the peloton um, but although it was windy this morning Daniel when you were driving down the course it had completely dropped by the yeah, time was, the race <laughs> it was actually pretty deceptive everyone had these so I think coffee this in the publicity caravan have been handing out these flags and there are there are thousands of them on the route and the spectators have, have picked up and they they really look as though you know they any conditions they look as though it's blowing a gale and I think it was pretty windy but we saw these these flags bent over quite spectacularly it looked like there was a tornado but um, I think it, they were fairly moderate winds but I think strong enough for splits in the first half of the race but obviously no team was wanting to split it with 100 kilometers to go and have to drill it from there and then in the second half of the race there were really no there weren't long sections where you were exposed it tended to be gusts which lasted you know, for 500 metres a, a kilometre of the course and then you would come to a sheltered area, built up area so it wasn't really ideal for a sustained effort by, by one team or group of riders. It's a shame because we were looking forward to that and uh, at the start I spoke to Garmin Sharp's director sportif Andreas Clear about the phenomenon of echelons and the skills required to uh, ride in the wind and the havoc that can ensue so let's have a listen to him. Well, I'm here in Aix-en-Provence with Andreas Clear, who's one of the sports directors of the Garmin Sharp team. And when he was a rider, he was uh, one of the most experienced at riding in windy conditions. We often saw in the Tour of Qatar, he would be the man making the calls on the road for his team to try and get the echelons formed and break up the peloton. But first of all, Andreas, perhaps you could explain to our listeners exactly what an echelon is. That means that the peloton is uh, split through the wind in diff different pieces. Let's say, depends on the, how many people there are in the field, let's say 200. The road is six meters wide. So you have in one row 15 and behind them 15. So you have groups of 30 people, around 30 people. So this makes five groups. You just can't hold the wheel on position 31 in that case. So you fall into the second echelon. That means if the wind is from the left, the first rider of the small group is riding totally on the left side of the road. The last rider on the right, of course. And um, they are totally rotating all the time. It's like you're hitting the front maybe two seconds. Mm -hmm. And is that because the wind is so strong, it naturally wants to push you over to the other side of the road, so your heart rate starts to race if you're riding for a long period in directly in the wind, so you want to just get off the front as quickly as you can? Uh, it has something to do with the power. Right. I, I think you have a certain kind of power you can push on the pedal, and uh, you're moving anyway forward, and if the wind comes from behind side, it's the most dangerous. Can, which, which could happen mm -hmm. uh, you're speeding up to let's say 65 70 per hour and uh, you, you push maybe 400 and something watts so how long can you hold that not not very long and if you share your power output with 30 other guys or 29 it's of course easier and you make out of 65 per hour you make maybe 67 and that's the moment where the person 31 drops and make the second echelon. So the person 31, in uh, the ideal circumstances, he would move then also to the left totally with again 29 in his wheel mm -hmm. and make the same thing like the first group. And therefore you see many times in TV, uh, group one, two, three, four, um, for a long time in the same, with the same uh, distance in between, like set, say 20 seconds and you think as a spectator why, why they don't just close it mm. because they are going on the maximum and it's impossible. 
And it's the echelons form typically when the wind is from either the left or the right, or it could be slightly cross headwind or cross tailwind, but yes. it's generally when the wind is coming from the side that the echelons form. And so it's purely a matter of mathematics. There is only enough width for a certain number of riders. Yes, yes that's very right. And so what is it like when you're in, the, say, a second group or a third group and you're trying to close the gap? It's impossible. You just look to the, third, to the group in front of you. It doesn't matter which group you are. And most of the time, like let's say in these races in Qatar, it's day by day the, the same 20 guys plus uh, five lucky ones. Mm -hmm. But the 20, the, the core of this first group is more or less always the same. And um, because you also want to be in the first group, you know, okay, Tom Bonin is very good in this. So uh, this is the guy you, you let also ride in front of you or behind you and, and so on. And after maybe 2K, this group is... Is, uh, is, uh, is made and then you try not to ride against each other first of all you try to ride with each other even if it sounds strange even if you're from different teams mm -hmm. uh, just to make sure that you will never be the 31 per mm -hmm. because if these two crew come together it's exactly the same thing again mm -hmm. so it's very stressful so the reason we're talking about this today is because we're in the south of France where the Mistral blows, so there is the possibility of wind, but you were saying just before uh, we started this interview that it's a little bit early at the moment to know what the conditions will be like on the road. So how will you communicate that to the riders and at what point will you know that the wind is up and perhaps a change of direction on the course will potentially cause some splits? I will ride with my car in front of the peloton like I did the last days to find spots where I think it is dangerous and I try to stay as close as possible to the peloton, let's say 20k in front, that the time differences are not too big, that I say now it's a lot of wind and uh, when they come it's no wind or something like that. So I have to make sure calls, I have to make not too many that they really believe it. You're kind of the weatherman today then, is that, uh, you're, you're looking out? It's not out only the weather, I mean sometimes you ride through villages where you say, oh man, if they are racing 18 to go, mm -hmm. uh, it can happen a crash and it's not that we are racing for, for a stage victory in a flat stage, but of course we would like to come healthy mm -hmm. into the finish line. These and, are the calls I also make. Yeah. And finally, what is it that makes a rider good at being in the right position when the wind is blowing? Because everybody wants to be in the first 30, but only 30 can. So is it a matter of luck or experience to be in that position, or do you just have to use your head to, to, to predict what is going to happen when the, when the direction of the course changes? I think you can't train this. It's like when you're born as a climber, you're a climber, and TT is TT, and uh, uh, echelon riding is also something very special and therefore you always see the same people, therefore uh, you can't train it. Of course, the older you get, the more experience you have, but then if you want to do it, you also on the other side need people who listen to you, and then uh, because if only you know it and you communicate, and then they think, yeah, yeah, thanks Andreas, yeah. Uh, it doesn't help. It's a team event, it's a team, sure. so you have to do it as a team. If you don't have it, that's actually the key. <laughs> Andreas Clear, thank you very much. I'm hoping for some echelons today. This is a humansinvent.com Tour de France podcast with Richard Moore, Daniel Freib and Lionel Burney. Here we are in Montpellier discussing today's stage. Lionel's just asking whether any of us can remember any time in a stage of the tour that there hasn't been a break. Do we remember a single stage? It will have happened, but I'm just... Yeah, I'm, I'm at a loss it's to think. I mean, normally there's something, isn't there? There's normally, uh, even if it's... I've, uh, in recent years, there have been occasions where breaks got away really early and been caught really early, and then they've, they've yeah. been full gas, as they say, all the way to the finish. But I can't remember a day of such little... There we are, competition. today's competition. If you can tell us when the last time there has been no break at all, you will win a copy of the Cycling Anthology. If you can tweet your answer... Uh, assuming there has been, uh, there must have been a stage. Tweet at Lionel Burney. I, mean, I, I suppose what we should emphasise is, although the crosswinds didn't really materialise quite the way ex we expected them, it was a very, very, it was a, a quite a fast stage, um, certainly in the closing stages, and it was very, very nervous. A lot of riders have been speaking tonight about how stressful it was, and you know, there, there was clearly there was the air of something about to happen for a long, long time. I mean. From 80, like 90 kilometres ago, teams were massing at the front, 
um, and, and it was already very fast. It was, I know obviously the GC uh, contenders, teams were all there, Team Sky were very prominent, Saxo, Tinkoff were very prominent as well. Garrett Thomas was, was doing a lot for Team Sky, which suggests he might be on the, on the road to recovery. Um, and there were obviously the sprinters team as well Omega Pharma, Quickstep were actually pretty active all stage weren't they and uh, Rolf Aldag afterwards and Patrick Lefebvre both suggested that maybe they'd been too active too early because they fell apart in the closing stages let's talk about those closing stages uh, Cavendish crashed with 33 kilometres to go um, it looked like quite a we didn't see the crash but judging from the state of his British champion's jersey, which had looked very you know, pristine, was was torn and dirty. He seemed to have landed on his left side, rolled onto his back, and um, he needed a change of bike. Then took him six kilometres. Actually, Aldag mentioned that the, the, the team car had been on the other side of the roundabout and almost didn't see him and almost disappeared up the road, which would have been a bit of a disaster because he needed a new bike. And it took him then six kilometres of, of hard chasing on his own to get back and uh, it was interesting speaking to Tal Dag about that because we were wondering I think a few of us whether he should have had teammates helping him and he said well at that point there's no real point because if you send eight riders back or six riders back or four they can't really sit in the in the cars then and there's a danger that all four get, get left behind so one rider on his own can there is a kind of blind eye if he's crashed you know and been dropped there's usually a blind eye turn to sitting in the cars although famously Cam's got in trouble for that before, or not got in trouble, but in that his first ever tour in 2007, do you remember the stage to Canterbury? Um, he, he, he was knocked off there, and they ordered a barrage where they wouldn't let the cars um, sit back directly behind the bunch and allowing, allowing him passage back up to the bunch. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the pros and cons of being such a big star, he often talks about the scrutiny he's subjected to as the world's number one sprinter, the cameras are always on him, etc, etc, but I think there are also benefits to it as well. I think, well, I think at 33 kilometres to go, it had it been the final 20, I think it would have been different, mm. but at 33 kilometres to go, they were happy, but you, you could see the effort it took, I mean, you know, even jumping from car to car, sitting behind his own team car for a while, he was putting big effort into that, and watching it, as I say, it went on for six kilometres, watching it, he thought, never mind his wounds, um, this is going to take something out of his sprint at the end. And I think that's what happened as well as the uh, disappearance of his team in the closing kilometres. Yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting though you, what you said about Lotto Belisol because obviously they were, they were kind of down last night because Jürgen Vandenbroek's crash in, in, the, in the final... Uh, in the finishing straight yesterday and he's he's injured and out of the tour and so I spoke to Adam Hansen this morning their kind of road captain or one of their road captains I mean, they've, got, they've got such a strong lead out um, team and uh, Adam was saying that it meant that now everything that Lotto Bellasol is going to do in this race is, is for Greipel because now they don't have to worry about trying to protect um, Jürgen Vandenbroek uh, because he's not here he was their kind of hope for a, a, a decent overall placing, um, probably a sort of outside bet for the podium. So their game plan this morning was everything for Greipel, and I think perhaps they had been criticised for getting a bit over-anxious, a bit over-excited and, and, and burning their matches too soon on the previous sprint stages. But today you could see that they were really revved up, um, and, and they got it pretty much spot on, I thought. What happened to Omega Pharma Quickstep, Daniel? I think they went too early. I mean, there's an interesting battle of wits taking place, isn't there, between those two teams? The Lotto guys spoke tonight about the timing of their effort and how they'd been told by their team manager, uh, Mark Sargent, to only really um, go to the, f the front of the bunch at around 2.3 kilometres to go, it, you know, which was a lot later than yesterday. And I, I mean, I think it, it has become more popular. It has become more difficult for Omega Pharma and, and Cavendish's teams, not just Omega Pharma, but Sky and before them HTC High Red. With time, um, more and more riders, more and more teams have deployed more and more resources in their sprint trains. And there are three really serious sprint trains operating in the race at the moment. Certainly, Argo Shimano are very, very powerful. I mean, I don't think in the last 1.5 kilometres they're particularly accomplished yet but that they are you know, they pose serious problems to Omega Pharma and, and that was really what disrupted them today I think um, Kwiatkowski sort of lost control of the situation a little bit you, Rich you pointed out earlier watching it 
um, how nervous he looks and how he's constantly looking around. I mean, it's a huge responsibility for a guy in his first tour, I think he's 22 years old, to be doing his job at, I think, about 2K from the finish he does his job. It, yeah, I mean, yesterday as well uh, in Marseille, it, it worked out very well for them there, but it was very noticeable that he did keep looking around, that he did look nervous, and he was looking for guidance, I think, from Chavanel yesterday, and today as well, when he went on the front, he, he didn't appear... Uh, sure, he didn't seem sure that he should be fully committed to it and you know, there is a sort of nervousness and we have spoken and certainly Patrick Lefebvre spoke I think after Skelder Priest this year mm. he, where he was really quite dismissive and uh, um, uh, quite uh, quite critical of his team for basically lacking balls mm. didn't he? I mean he basically said that he basically said they'd, they'd chickened out of the, uh, of, of, the, of the sprint there, I mean that's the other thing. The more sprint trains there are trying to set their men up, the more dangerous it is and the more crowded out it becomes. We saw today in the closing kilometres a, a BMC rider sort of going head-to-head with a lotto rider. And the BMC rider was trying to keep Cadet 11s up and they were, they, were, they were rutting, you know, they were locking heads. And you think, so the GC guys are also getting in the mix and they're trying to keep their riders up there. And, you know, there's more and more people trying to um, occupy... Uh, a pretty small space at the front of the peloton there, which makes so. I think this this first week is always like this at the tour when the, you know, Chris Froome talking afterwards did say that the race after the mountains will settle down a bit. They'll become a natural pecking order. I mean, the other thing to say is that I think these stages are absolutely thrilling now. I mean, people uh, dismiss the sprint stages that as the kind of prelude to the real action, but I think partly thanks to guys like Mark Cavendish who speak so well about sprint finishes now we understand more and more about them and you know thanks also to the um, helicopter shots that we see on the TV we can really dissect them really well and see um, what's going on you know in a, to a level of detail that we didn't perhaps we weren't you know weren't aware um, what was going on earlier. I, 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 sorry I still think that Cavendish did sort of emerge and there was daylight between him and the line in the final 150-200 metres and I thought the Cavendish, a fresh Cavendish, could, might still have sort of turned on the afterburners at that point, and it just wasn't there. And I think that was the effort. There was also an effort he made um, to get into that position in the final kilometre, which Aldag also mentioned, which probably also cost him. He had to keep making these little efforts to do. I'm glad that Griper won today because it keeps it interesting. Um, uh, you know, we've got. Uh, first week is is drawing to a close last year the three sprinters Greipel, Cavendish and Peter Sagan um, they they had three stage wins each um, coming to the end of the first week you know after the finish at Albi tomorrow they could each have one stage win and uh, so it's not only is it setting up the, the battle of the sprinters well for that middle section next week where we've got a run of um, sprint stages coming after the time trial but it's going to make the green jersey competition really come alive, I think, and and that's what that competition you know needs. needs. I mean, Sargam did win that uh, quite convincingly last year in the end, um, and so it's going to keep the race you know really boiling away before the bit that everyone's looking forward to, um, Mont Ventoux and the Alps. We mentioned a lot of bells on how they got it spot on today. Uh, Daniel spoke. Uh, after the stage to Lars Back, a member of that lead out train, and I spoke to Greg Henderson, and we can hear from both of them now. Actually, uh, Mark Shishan, he said, uh, try to stay behind Quick Step, let them do the rough work, and then uh, try to come uh, with 2.3k uh, with, with, with the train, which is Andre, Henderson, CB, and Ruiland, you know, like Jürgen Ruiland, and uh, then we need like to, to start it up. Now, I could not see from position where I was, but I think it went good, and he, he yes. won, so. That was actually the plan, and, and the, the tactic uh, was good today. Uh, you said yesterday that you know you made one one small mistake yesterday. What was the mistake, and what, what did you do right today? Oh, we lit out on the wrong side of the road yesterday. It was a left-hand corner. You should always protect the inside, and we left it open, and quick step came through. And uh, I did a lot of yelling and screaming. <laughs> Not really, but I was pretty disappointed that we made such a simple mistake. I was yelling at the time, but because of the crowds, it's so late, you just can't hear anything. And uh, that was our mistake. And so did you have a sit down last night and go over that, review that? This morning, yeah. This morning. Uh, no, it's like we're all. Anyway, it's like it's not like we get angry with each other. We just we're disappointed. All of us are disappointed, you know. Not at someone. It's just uh, one of those things where we don't like missing out. And today did that go pretty much according yeah, to plan? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, we 
I, we had a 20 minute meeting and sat down with the boys and I said this is what we have to do, This is, I said let's work it backwards, go straight back to square one, I said right, my job, I have to get Gribal to 200, Yogi, you go at 800, get me to 500, you know, we stepped it through like the first time we're doing a lead out, and it went perfect. Did you, I mean, I know all the teams now are kind of getting information from the finish, how do you get that information, do you have somebody writing the finish or videoing it or what, what Mario Hertz is up there and Mario yeah, yeah. yeah. So he, and when does he relay, relay that information? On the radio. That's so he rides it just before the, the, the actual yeah. oh, He doesn't ride it, he just drives it. Yeah. The most important thing was the wind. We knew it was going to be tailwind and fast, so so go early. It was quite a technical finish those last couple of kilometres. Yeah, it's really hard. Really, you had to stay right up in the front. How but many how many wins is that you've been you've led uh, Greipel to? I must be up a pay rise with no? Sure. It must be, it must be <laughs> at least thirty, is it? Let's or say that, let's say that. Fifty? Yeah, <laughs> fifty, hundred? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll call that your 50th, all right? half century. <laughs> right, mate, Congratulations. Congrats Cheers, century. Greg. You're listening to the Tour de France podcast with humansinvent.com and Sharp. Here we are in Montpellier, chaps. Lionel, Bernie, Daniel Freeman, me, Richard Moore. We've done a competition tonight already. We're going to mention, we've got another competition prize to announce and a reminder that you can win a phone call from David Miller on the rest day. Mm-hmm by uh, tweeting hashtag tour moments like your your favourite tour moment there uh, there have been a flood of entries to that obviously a lot of people wanting a phone call from David Miller on Monday uh, some really good ones so keep them coming in and a winner will be selected uh, before Monday's stage before Monday's rest day should I say um, I've also got a competition prize to announce because last night I mentioned this fight in the Vuelta in 1995 and a lot of people correctly identified the two riders, um, including uh, Dominic O'Brien, Brinley Davis, Gareth Enticott. But the winner uh, was the first one out of the blocks uh, was Mark Stringer, uh, who correctly identified them as Ramo Arieta, the Benesta rider, and Leonardo, Leonardo Sierra from Carrera. Well worth watching on YouTube that fight between those two riders. They got off their bikes and started lamping each other in their cleated cycling shoes. Highly entertaining. Do you, do you get a jersey for that? Is there some kind of... Uh, oh, so the prize? For, no, no, for, for, for most combative rider. I mean, is that... Yeah, is that we, we were going to do some prizes, daily prizes, weren't we? A couple of years ago on a podcast, we did a daily... They have on the on the tour a daily aggressive rider prize, and we did a, a an, a, an inertia prize, a prize every day for the most lazy <laughs> rider. Um, maybe we should revive that quickly, Daniel. There was a lot of debate about what inertia actually meant. Though, there was. It? it did spark it a furious that. debate. I don't, I don't know why we didn't. We did just look it up. We kept looking it up, but we kept even arguing about the dictionary what definition. Yeah. Any pri- any nominations for inertia prize today, Lionel? I think it's pretty harsh, isn't it? You're riding the Tour de France and get accused of inertia. I mean, I that's think the win was pretty. I'll, I'll nominate Simon Gerrans uh, for losing his yellow jersey for, <laughs> through through sheer laziness at the end, and that brings us nicely on to the new yellow jersey, Daryl Impey, uh, the first ever South African. We expected an African-born rider to wear a yellow jersey this tour, but we expected it to be Chris Froome. I don't think anybody predicted Daryl Impey, but he took over the yellow jersey from his uh, teammate Simon Gerrans, the winner of the Inertia Prize, who lost five seconds, I think, just in, in a split at the end. Now. There was talk at the start of the stage that, that, that he would sort of try and engineer um, Impey into, into yellow because they were still equal on time and it needed uh, Impey to, to you know, get a higher placing than him on, on the stage. But he's now got it on time. Was it not a deliberate, did he not? Well, there is, there, that's been mentioned certainly that it might have been deliberate. Um, I bet. I'm, double, sure, I'm sure Garen's is saying that it was deliberate. A no. double a double benefit for Garen's because not only does his, the jersey pass on to teammate, but he wins the Inertia Prize on our daily podcast. Well, what happened was that Impey is, there, is, is the slightly better sprinter in those conditions than Garen's. I mean, Garen's has got a very, very good finish, but um, mm. not, in, not necessarily in the sort of... Uh, the more drag strip type sprint that we had today, um, and there was just a little split, wasn't there? I think was it three seconds, at the five. three or five, five seconds. There we are, five seconds. Um, I think fifteen or a dozen riders were, were ahead of the split, and so Jaron sees the yellow jersey um, move across to his teammate Daryl Olympia and I, I think that's, uh, I think Tanman was saying uh, a couple of days ago in the podcast um, about what kind of tight unit the Orica Green Edge squad is, and. 
it's, it's re always really interesting when a when a yellow jersey moves from the shoulders of one teammate to another, and it'll be interesting to go and have a chat with Orica Greenedge tomorrow morning and find out whether there was any kind of. Uh, plan to try and place the jersey onto the shoulders of let's remember a south african rider riding for an australian squad yeah but the, i mean it gives it's another it gives fresh kind of uh, coverage exposure to that team because it's a new story it's a good story 100th tour first uh, african uh, yellow, in the yellow jersey uh, and daryl impey is uh, i think a, a deserving winner he's had a very up and down career um more downs than ups i think he's 28 now he um he was part of the ill-fated Pegasus project, the Australian team, a couple of years ago. He was also had a terrible crash at the Tour of Turkey, where he was leading overall, wasn't he? And Theo Boss uh, ran him into the barriers there in the, in the sprint finish, and he, he had a, his career looked to be in jeopardy at that time. Uh, he came back very well from that. He won a contract for a bit with Radio Shack, didn't he? he rode with Radio Shack for a while, uh, and he, he's been a very much a journeyman pro, drifting around. He, al he also had the misfortune of having dinner with myself and Gregor Brown in Como a couple of years ago. So, you know, very up and down career indeed. So you're naturally attributing today's success to the, the origin of this success back to that dinner? Yeah, well, clearly. certainly, I, think we, I don't think it would be too much of an exaggeration to claim that. A very nice bloke, very nice chap, and uh, I think he will uh, do the yellow jersey proud. Any other business? I mean, apart from the inertia prize, we did talk about having uh, other prizes. Maybe, well, maybe, maybe take your suggestions on that as well. If anyone's got any suggestions for a, uh, a daily prize, they, they used to do the Pedalard de la Charme, de la Charme, de Charme, the the most elegant rider award. A daily Hugo Cobley, the Swiss. The thing on this is quite well. You were talking about Kirienka today. Kevin Razor yesterday looked pretty damn good, no? So. Do we? I mean, does does this award apply to the most stylish looking rider on the bike or the most stylish looking rider off the bike? Could be either, man. Could be either. Uh, Karienka, I mean, unbelievably smooth. Mm. He, you know, he looks like I think I look when I ride my bike. You certainly don't, Rich. I can confirm that exclusively. Yeah. Just at his podcast. upper body doesn't move a millimeter. No, and uh, when you see him on the front, as we will do, I'm sure, in the, uh, the two Pyrenean stages that, um, uh, that are coming up, you know, it, it, it is metronomic, it's a bit of a cliche, but he, he, he is one of those riders who just taps out a rhythm and makes it look incredibly easy, mm. and, and uh, w watching on television it is deceptive, but that sort of pedalling style does almost seem to iron out the gradient and make it appear flatter than it actually is. Funny old sport, isn't it, when a guy like Kirienka uh, is a domestique to a rider uh, who doesn't really have the same <laughs> elegance. Chris Froome, who looks, as David Miller said last year, like he's riding a motorbike that's going too fast for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not, the, it's not the prettiest style, is it? But, um, you know, style doesn't necessarily win the Tour de France. It's, uh, it's about turning the pedals over as, as quickly as you can. I mean, an obvious thing to say. But, yeah, it's not the most comfortable thing to watch and I think a lot of sports where uh, I think certainly in France the, the public the public the TV the commentators and the pundits um, they do champion people who have got a kind of aesthetic charm mm. and I don't think Froome is necessarily going to win uh, win win the sort of um, hearts for his style on the bike necessi necessarily but I think his sort of personality and charm and easy manner off the bike is kind of almost um, diametrically absolutely. opposed to the way, the way he actually pedals. Yeah, I, actually heard, I actually heard one of the France 2 correspondents waiting in the huge melee outside the Quick Step bus tonight. It was absolute chaos in Montpellier tonight, but um, one of the France 2 correspondents um, talking to another journalist about what, what a charming guy Chris Froome was and what, what a refreshing change it was after dealing with Bradley Wiggins last year, who was sauvage, wild, he said. Wild. <laughs> Well, Chris Froome isn't, isn't wild. And on that note, I think we'll wrap it up for tonight. Um, we'll be back uh, tomorrow in Albay to talk about a stage that may or may not end in a bunch of sprints. About time we reintroduced Chiro as well, one of these days. <laughs> Chiro is champing at the bit to come back on our podcast, as is Tan Man. We're fighting these guys off. We've got to find a corner here that, know, that might, where they won't find us. We might just throw Chira and Tanman in the in the ring and stand back and see what happens. Right. Yeah. Tanman and his tankini. We can go for a beer and uh, let them get on with it. Let them get on with Goodbye, it. everybody. <laughs> yes, thank you for listening once again, and we'll be back with you tomorrow for more chat on the 2013 Tour de France.